is Yehuda Tasa, and that's the original name. My, uh, I was born in Jerusalem in 1936 to parents that immigrated from Yemen uh, in 1921. Okay. You should look at me. I, uh, I'm sorry. I in 1929. Initially, they lived in Tel Aviv. After a couple of years, they moved to Jerusalem. Because for them, Jerusalem was the holy city, and uh, that's what my father uh, went to Jerusalem, built the synagogue, and he was a cantor, Hassan, whatever they call it. And, uh, and he, he made a living by continuing in his profession which was the uh, filigree jewelry that he did in Yemen. He had a store there and uh, primarily he worked for Arab women, uh, did uh, lots of jewelry for them, as well as uh, Jewish people. And, uh, and we were six in the family, uh, four brothers and uh, two sisters. And that's, I guess, uh, the introduction of myself. Okay. So can you tell me about your father, where he was born, where your mother was born, how they met each other, if you know that story? Yeah. My father born in a, I actually don't know exactly the city that he lived, that's what he born. But he became orphaned very early in the age. Both of his parents died. And uh, I think at the age of uh, 12, he went to Taez. Taez is the city south of uh, Sana'a, the city, very close by. And uh, after that, he moved to Eib, Eib is another, another city. He met my mother and they got married. And then uh, he used to have, uh, he owned a store that he did jewelry with his brother. And uh, that's about the, uh, the story of it. How did he learn the filigree if he was an orphan? Yeah, no, he, you know, in Yemen you, you learn it very early age. Can you talk so, about that a little bit? What's that? Can you talk about the filigree I, in Yemen? Yeah, I, can, I know a little bit about that. But uh, he learned it from uh, his father and then his uncle, that they worked together. And uh, after that, he was like a, uh, a student in other places until he managed to get, uh, you know, a store for himself and work. Tell me about your mother and where she was born. And... Uh, yeah, my mother uh, was born in Yemen in uh, Abe. Uh, her parent, uh, my father, by the way, he had her parents to, go, uh, to move to Israel. He paid the trip and everything. And then they lived with us until both of them died. But they lived. Now, my grandfather, he was uh, a jeweler as well. Uh, he helped my, uh, my father in his uh, work. And uh, he died pretty late. It was amazing. You know because many Yemen had died very early. You know. How did your parents meet each other, do you know? I, I think it's a matter of, uh, in Yemen, uh, you, you have a matchmaker. That's, uh, they don't go to party and meet. <laughs> How did they um, move to Israel? What made them leave Yemen? It was a long trip because it was initiated by themselves. He wanted to be in Israel for a long time, until he decided definitely. So he moved with, his mo with my mother, and my older uh, brother, he was like one year old. And I remember she was pregnant with the second uh, brother. And uh, so they uh, walked for a few days until they got to Aden, and then from there they took the boat uh, uh, move to Israel.
When they left, did they leave everything behind? Yeah, you leave everything, yeah. Not only that, you don't tell even the Muslim neighbor that you want to leave. Because some, you know, something could endanger them, you know. Did so they, they left everything, yeah. All of the silver work they left? Yeah, he took some, you know, the, the most precious in gold. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, uh, it was sudden move, you know. Do you know what the triggers were that made them leave when they left, aside from your father wanting to go to Israel? Was there something that happened in the community where they said no, it's time? No, uh, you know, in Yemen it's a very cyclic. Uh, you know, you can have a, a period with very good uh, president, that he was good to the Jewish people, uh, and will be another one that will be very bad for him. And he come with lots of uh, prohibition and all that. And in Yemen, the Jewish people have very restricted, you know, uh, rules, and they have to pay for, you know, like the protection taxes. Yeah, and uh, and they did it, you know, with all the humili humiliation that they did to the Jews. Uh, by the way, the Christian used to be there until the 11th century. After that, they didn't want to obey all the prohibition and they left Yemen. So I heard that in Yemen, the, the orphans were forced to convert to Islam. That yeah, didn't if, if uh, a family that the parent died and uh, he had, they have children, by the Muslim law, they have to be converted to Islam. So, if the government knows about it, immediately they come. You don't have any, any family member a choice. Now, if many times it happened that 12 years or 13 years old girl will get you know, married to an old guy, and the reason they did it to save her from being converted to Islam. Yeah. And your father wasn't converted? No, no. Uh, my grandfather, for a while, he was converted to Islam Muslim. And after a few years, he converted back. How did that? Can you, do you know? I, I really don't know exactly the reason. I think it was more economic issue that he converted, and then after that, he converted back. Wow, I never and, heard a story yeah. like that before. Oh, it, it happened quite, uh, quite many cases. Wow. And uh, in Israel, that obviously he was, uh, by definition, a Jewish. Yeah. So, but when he went to Israel, by the time your grandfather went to Israel, he was converted back no, to Judaism? No, he Judea? was already a Jew. Yeah. yeah. But As a matter of fact, if you, uh, you know, this uh, question was, uh, they asked the uh, Arambam at that time, what to do if we have to be by force to be converted? And he really answered them a very good answer, that as long as you are in your heart Jewish, that's okay, you know. Don't feel, you know, bad about it. And he kind of allowed them, you know, that uh, it's not something very bad, because it's uh, otherwise it's in danger, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, there is a, in my family, there was a, my aunt, a, she has a brother, or two brothers, but a, and they got all, you know, her parents, both parents died, and the Muslim took her brother, converted him to Islam. Now, it was a big story in Israel. They somehow, I don't know how it was uh, sneaked to the newspaper, but uh, anyhow, uh, he was really uh, lived with a very high level Muslim in judici judiciary uh, profession, 
one of the highest level. And he, uh, the boy was very, very bright, and he really became like a son. And later on, there was an article that he was the supreme judge in Yemen. And after that, and they show it in Aulam uh, Azeh, in Israel, the picture of his sister and him, very, very similar. And at one point, they nominated him to be a president. Now, the story is that they did not want uh, to be advertised, his sister, and she didn't want to talk about it. For her, he doesn't exist because he converted. It's not his fault. Now, her son uh, was in the Second World War, and he used to get letters from him when he was a supreme judge, and he would send him packages to the army, you know, in World War II. So that is the story that's running in the family. Wow. Yeah. That's a big story. Yeah, Thank there you. is a big article, you know. If you, you want, I can yeah. uh, refer you to that. Yeah. So I heard also in Yemen, all the different families had different styles of silver work. Yeah, they, it's a. Uh, they, you know, the jewelry in Sana, the capital city, was a uh, is slightly different. So did your it's family very have gen a gen what? Did your family have a specific style? I think it was more close to Sana'a style, yeah, because he had connection with lots of uh, jewelers in Sana'a. And uh, it is known there that, uh, let's say, special necklace or some other ornament is uh, one family know how to do it. And it was known that it is a style of so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, But if you move to the out, out of uh, Sana, the style is uh, more, uh, how do I express it? It's not uh, finesse like the Sana, but it's still very innovative, mm -hmm. like the Haban, Haban family that come from Haban. Their jewelry is very coarse, very, it's not the same as uh, Sana. So in Yemen, did your parents speak Arabic? Oh, yeah. We speak Arabic even in Israel. Did they... Yemenite Arabic, yeah. Can you, you know, speak... The Arabic has lots of style. Can you speak Yemenite Arabic? Of course. Can you speak... With my mother, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you say something? No, I don't want to say <laughs> No? Okay. But with my mother, she never spoke Hebrew. We had to speak with her Yemenite. But you learned Hebrew. Oh, yeah. Or learned. they learned Hebrew. In, in school, in school, they learned. Yeah. Okay. But so, uh, with my father and mother, it's only Yemen, I guess. Can you, you don't want to speak just a little bit? No, I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> so, do you know when your parents went to Israel, what life was like for them when they first arrived with your brother? Did they live in Mabarot? Did they live in... No, they, uh, they I don't really remember what, uh, in the, initially, what they lived. I know they lived in the... My father bought uh, property there in Akerem Atemanim and he lived there. After a few years, he went back, oh, he went to Jerusalem and bought their house and built it. Does your family uh, still have the property in the Akerem? We have in the Akerem, still, it's empty lot. Which street is it? Do you uh, know? Kihilat Eden. It's really a very good place. Yeah. <laughs> but now it's only, because it's an old house, they have to wipe it off, you know. So when they were in Israel, did they live in, within tight... Can you talk about the Karam a little bit, how it was back then? I don't, uh, you know, I, 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 I was never lived there. I mean, I was born in Jerusalem when he already moved to Jerusalem. But not even the Karam, just the Yemenite quarters in Israel? Like yeah, it was a Karam at Temanim. It was a, a, a special quarter for the Yemenite, one of them. Rosh Ha'ayin was another one. And uh, in the neighborhood that we used to live, uh, it was the Yemenite neighborhood. 
after many years, they diffused to all kinds of them. Rehovo, Sharaim, uh, Marmorek was a very concentrated with Yemenite immigrants. So when you went to school, where are you going to school? What kind of school did you go to? I did a uh, school in Jerusalem, but it was uh, only um, elementary school. I couldn't, I had to work and I could continue, you know, high school or whatever. I went one year on the evening high school, but I left after that. Yeah. Mom? Oh, okay, that's not important. <laughs> what is that? What? No, in, my, in the school that I was in elementary school, I think second grade, something like that, third grade, uh, one of the of Vedic sociality, if you know what it is. Social, uh, yeah. Social. She, and the teacher, she was a teacher also. And uh, she saw, I don't know what, what uh, I impressed her. She thought I was a talented boy <laughs> and should study in Rehavia. And she, it was private school, by the way. And uh, I don't know who paid, but probably some of the government paid it. Uh, the money for that private school. And there was all the wealthy people of Jerusalem. And I had to be there. <laughs> Were there other Mizrahi Jews or was it mostly Ashkenazi? Mostly Ashkenazi. Nin I would say 95%. Yeah. Did uh, is a, yeah. one of the elite uh, neighborhoods. Did your parents experience a lot of discrimination? I don't know. I don't think they, because, you know, discrimination there was in Israel against the MNI and against many others that are later on came. The Ethiopian, even today, we hear it. Uh, personally, I don't think my father and my mother met with clashes like that because they were not, you know, they would work at home and no much contact. But uh, there was, uh, definitely. You know. Did you experience discrimination? What's it? Did you experience discrimination? I don't uh, know if it's, uh, you know, something that I can identify. But uh, I don't know, I, I didn't meet that, but definitely it was. It was not that. It's not uh, something that you can say there was no discrimination. So what are some of the memories of foods that you, your mother used to make and you, you used to eat? Did well, you eat food? the Yemenite foods in Israel? Uh, yeah, yeah the, you know, Yemenite food is very restricted. They're not, they don't have a, a, a variety of things, but mostly it's soup, chicken soup. And uh, Saturday they make the jangon and the malawa and all kinds of that. Uh, but really, we did not have any other luxury, you know. What about um, religious observance? Did you go to Beit Knesset with Every your Saturday, we I have to. My father was a Hazan. And during the week, I would sit opposite him. And he, you know, Yemenet can read back, uh, backwards. So he can, I, I look at the book and he can see exactly if I make a mistake. So I, I was trained by him for every Saturday to do Aliyah Shishi. Every Saturday I have to do it. Later on, the Yemenite, uh, in the Yemenite synagogue, the authentic one, you read one uh, sentence in the Torah and then a boy usually read the translation of Aramaic of that sentence. One one all the time. Yeah. So do you know Aramaic? Yeah. I that's uh, <laughs> by by you know, I was reading the Aramaic knowing what the Pasuk in Hebrew. Yeah. That way I connected. And Aramaic by the way, it's uh, very similar to Kurdish. It's exactly that. It's uh, Aramaic. 
So were there other special observances or practices that were unique to your Yemenite community in Israel? Like, was there anything that you did that was a little bit different aside from the Aramaic? Mm. No, we lived in uh, uh, basically cosmopolitan of uh, different immigrants uh, from Syria, Halep, uh, from Persia, Iran. Really, our neighborhood was lots of immigrants from different countries. Everyone has his own synagogue. And once in a while, we used to go to other synagogues, you know. Did your parents ever talk about going back to Yemen? Did they ever? Never, never. No, for them, the, being in Jerusalem, that's the ultimate, you know. Yeah. So... They dream about it for thousands of years. Yeah. Eventually he found that it was, you know, he was lucky to. So, most of the people who I interview are from the, they're from Yemen or they're from an Arab country, so it's different. It's a little different interviewing people who are born in Israel. There's not as much, in, I can't get as much information. But, um, so I think that the last thing that's really unique is for you to talk about your filigree and how you decided to go back to it and all of okay. that story. I know you've told it a bunch of times, but... Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, you know, as a boy, I had to work, you know, especially when, uh, you know, initially I was trained with my, with, by my father, but he died when he was like 43. I was uh, about eight, nine years old. So my older brother was about 13 years old, and he worked with my father quite a number of years. So I used to help him in learning the, the jewelry, and we have to make a living. We have six in the family, all of them under nine years old. And uh, so that's why I used to, you know, work day in, day out. And uh, so that's why school was not an issue. I could not pay attention too much to the school. And uh, so I worked that, uh, and then outside as well, you know, at store, different store, jewelry store, and the uh, other job that I have to make money so this family can go on. And uh, I think after that I went to the army, and coming back from the army, I back again to the jewelry, and develop a few other techniques, and uh, at one point, I decided that I have to decide to have different profession because it was very hard to make a decent living with uh, the jewelry. And uh, I had to learn by myself for matriculation in Israel. You have to have that in order to go to university. So I did that, working all day, coming back at home, study until three in the morning, and then the next day, the same thing. Uh, then I applied for, I wanted it, it, uh, to study aeronautics. That attracted me and I said, for that I'm willing to do the matriculation, you know, whatever. I did not have money, I work uh, uh, in construction building and all that to save some money for the school. And uh, at one point I uh, applied for a Hebrew University in the math physics department and then applied also for the Technion. Now the Technion, have, you have to, to do a test first in physics and math and the, tech, the, the Hebrew University, they will go by your grade. So I got uh, accepted to the math physics, but the technical delayed it. Later on, I had uh, accepted them, and obviously, I decided to go to the technical. And uh, after that, uh, you know, it's all study and work on the, uh, on the weekend 
in the Namal Haifa as a sabal to make a living for the next week to eat. The second year was easier since I got a job in the lab and from there on it uh, was easy. Uh, after that I went, uh, you know, uh, after graduation I went to accepted a job with uh, Israel Aircraft Industry and I was really among the first to do the first airplane that Israeli design, that was Arava. And after that I continued with, uh, at that time it was classified to do the Kfir, which is a fighter jet. Uh, at the end of uh, 71, we didn't have any really major project. We did like more research and all that. And I was offered uh, to do my PhD by a professor from United States. It was on a sabbatical year. Uh, to do my PhD with, with him under NASA grant. I accepted that. And from 72, I came to Cleveland the horrible weather <laughs> and uh, after four years I finished my PhD and worked for uh, for a while with NASA Lewis and then got accepted uh, a job by Lockheed at that time. We moved to Atlanta and after eight years we they uh, I think uh, disassembled the uh, the research there, and I moved to California, Palo Alto. In 98, after working there like 26 years, uh, I decided <coughs> to retire. They gave us a packet, and there was a, really the research in my area dwindled down, and I decided maybe that's a good time to do that. So. Um, at retirement, I took lots of uh, co uh, community college courses in arts and all that that I was interested in. And one of them was really doing lepidry, which is polishing stone. I wanted to learn it all my life. I did not know how they do it. So while I was doing that, my, uh, my instructor, he looked at my work and he said, with, exclamation, boy, you know, who did that, you know? I thought he referred to the son. I said, what are you joking? You taught me that. He said, no, no, the filigree that you did. I said, yeah, I did it. And then immediately he came with his boss and they said, oh, it's a lost art and you have to teach us and all that. So I said, okay, prepare a class, I'll be happy. And then it rang a bell to me. I talked to my brother in Israel that he also left the jewelry for many years. And he said, yeah, even in Israel, there are not many jewelry left that can do that. So my intention is to revive this profession, this art. And I continue to give classes, a workshop, and uh, do myself in show. And I investigate many different material now. That's about it, I think. So is there any other stories about your Yemenite heritage? Anything about your family? Anything that sticks out in your memory? No, I think I told you about that. Uh, our, one of my family was almost, was a president in Yemen. That's, yeah, that's uh, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I have so what argument. happened to him? Oh, he probably died, you know, at that time. I think there's a lot of people like that in Yemen, a lot of converted. There are many converted, yeah. There are many converted. Are they but aware they, of it? Do they, do they know their history, do you think? I really don't know. If, you know. if you could go visit Yemen, would you go visit? Oh, definitely I'd like to. When it will be safe. Not now. Yes. But, uh, no, I'd like to visit, you know, all the cities and the... Uh, uh, places that uh, my father and mother talked about. Uh, they have all, lots of stories, uh, you know, about Yemen. And uh, 
you know, there were times that they lived very nicely with the Arab, but uh, even with all the prohibition that they gave on them. You know, like uh, in Sana'a, they did not allow them to build houses higher than a Muslim neighbor. So what they, they, they did, they built it down under the ground. <laughs> I think that's it. And they kept, uh, you know, lots of uh, custom. They kept it, which they think it's really go back to King Solomon time. Like what? Many, in, you know, custom that really other Jewish uh, community in the world don't have it. I don't remember the detail, but it's really, you know, how to reading the Torah that one, one uh, pasuk and pasuk. Uh, the child. That is not, you don't see it in any Ashkenazi. Uh, and the Jewish community were really isolated from the Jew Jewry in the world. It's only, I think, uh, very late in the 18th century, they started to write letters to Jewish community in London and many other well, well known to get contact. But they were isolated for centuries. Anything else? Yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah. Okay. You could just tell me, hold it. You can hold it close up and tell me what it is. Yeah, that's a uh, both a pendant and a, a, a pin. You know, usually they do that. And it's a very tricky and very different uh, filigree element. You can see a three, uh, three levels of flower, one on top of the other, okay? And uh, I imitate that, uh, slightly different, but uh, I saw how much it is uh, tricky to, do, to keep that because the outer one is an open legs and it have to be really a tangent to the rim that you have a, a circle here. Okay. Who made that? What? Who made that? My father. Did he make, do you know if he made it in Israel or in Yemen? I, I think in Israel he did that, yeah. And that's, I think, your mother or? Yeah. Show her the bicep that, of my mom from What's that? Yeah. It's a little usually, my bicep. Oh, okay. And that is a... I, I, you know, for the advanced student, I give them to do uh, an ad advanced uh, project, and they do it as a circle, not a rectangular. But it, uh, the different levels of that, they do very similar to that. Beautiful. And it comes very nice, yeah. And uh, that's also another of my father, you know, that uh, pin and the pendant Can as well. Can you hold it just like that for one second? What? Well, Just sure stay it. still for one second. Okay. Okay. So that's also, if you look at the detail, it's a lot of different filigree and different things, you know, that you can... Uh, so that I give, if I, you know, for student, advanced student, you know, they see how, how hard it is to do that. Yeah. Your, your mother... Uh, I think I saw something. Yeah, I think I saw it somewhere. Yeah. Wow. And this is a, wow. a bracelet that they also made granulation with this tiny element. It's a very complicated, really, you know, element here. And the special thing here, there are missing stone here in all that. And the key here is a, an Indian, I would say, uh, a key that is uh, really screwed, that uh, Yemen adopted that uh, closure, you know. What is it? Oh, here it is. That's, no, that should be here. Yeah. And if you clockwise, it open up. Okay, here. <laughs> okay, you see the close up, it open up. It's like a screw, okay? And when you finish that, it open up. Oh. <laughs> it's a very primitive, but very interesting. <laughs> uh, Backward. It's amazing. It's so small. 
Oh, by the way, I have a couple of students that did that uh, really? similar to oh. that. Yeah. I have, I think, something that... Mm, no, that's not here. Your methods when you make the jewelry are the same methods that your grandfather and your great-grandfather used? Uh, approximately, yes, but there are, you know, we have now different tools, so it, it is oh. easier. But, uh, you know, yeah. but uh, because you have different technique, different tool, then you develop different technique yeah. that make it much easier. For instance, uh, on that side, you'll see the candle holder Shabbat. Uh -huh that this uh, they call we call it by the, uh, there are four components that are done by spinning spinning the silver and uh, then you come they solder all the four components and you make the big one that you have over there you know so that's a, a special art that uh, in yemen they didn't have that you know that kind of thing and uh, granulation is also very special art that only a few Yemenites knew to develop the special um, liquid that really attach and then can fuse the, those small granules. And that's only father to son. You cannot read it. Uh -huh. You cannot. They will not tell you that. Have you ever thought about writing all this stuff? You down? bet. I do. I have two DVD. But I have, uh, at the end, I'll put a book with 12 projects. As a matter of fact, I have many sections of the book already written because I give workshop, I hand out uh, a 